Well, good morning, everybody. Our first image today is some satellite data just as the sun was trying to rise across the east coast of the United States. And we're in a bit of a race right now with getting the sun up as quickly as we can, simply because last night the skies cleared out, winds calmed down, and we had some pretty strong radiational cooling resulting in some quite cold overnight low temperatures. And we've been concerned for a while about the extent southward of this cold air here. So we're waiting to see this um, the sunrise just to get the temperatures to warm back up a little bit. We'll take a closer look at those temperatures in a moment to try to understand and how far south that frost event got. But I'm going to take you back to yesterday because while we had some pretty thick cloud cover here over parts of the eastern Corn Belt and the Ohio River Valley, again, some embedded lake effect snow squalls in here uh, and some pretty chilly temperatures, you can see a couple of other interesting things. Uh, one, come out to the west, got a pretty good view of the uh, extent of the snowpack, which is good. And you can also see the upper level low continuing to spin over parts of Arizona, producing some pretty intense convection around this upper level low, which got into Southern California as well. You can see some of the embedded thunderstorm activity here. But then as the sun was setting, it was interesting to watch uh, the, the smoke that's right here in parts of the Mid-South and, and Delta region from some prescribed burns in this area. And I kind of zoomed in. Again, this is right where we're hoping the sun can hurry up and wait. Uh, get up here but if we take you back to yesterday this in the evening time period you can really see just a lot of smoke so i'll be flying uh this evening uh, down to dallas so i'm curious if we'll see more of that again today the big difference will be the winds will not be coming out of the northwest uh, today they're going to switch around out of the southwest and get quite strong uh, in this area so we'll, we'll take a look at that in a few moments but i mentioned the temperature so here's the large area of high pressure this morning and uh, certainly clearing uh, the way all the way through the Gulf of Mexico. We have a strong wind through the Tejano Pass down here. And so that cold air has advanced pretty far. But I was looking at the surface observations this morning just to get an idea on how far to the south that frost event went. And I just as a quick review on how to read these, you have your temperature in Fahrenheit here, your dew point temperature in Fahrenheit there. The circle actually gives an indication of cloud cover. Um, you have your pressure in the upper right hand corner. We won't worry about decoding that today, but then you have your station label and then the wind. And just remember that the, uh, the way that wind barbs work is that they push, I would say they push the ball. So this wind is going in this direction right now, but it's slow, it's only five knots. Now that's a good open one to see here. If we look across the southeast, I see that the frost line's somewhere in this vicinity, right? So you have 32, 31, 32, but I got some 36s, which means if we can get through the next hour, uh, we can hopefully keep the widespread frost event from getting too far to the south. Now there are always local effects, cold air drains. We know that, right? So there's going to be some local patchy frost that will get all the way probably to the Florida panhandle in this particular case. And this is what I had. You just kind of blend it all together and, and smooth out those temperatures as of 510 this morning central time. So pretty chilly morning again. And of course, the National Weather Service has these uh, fro excuse me, freeze warnings out for several states and parts of the south and southeast. Now around that, this particular shading, which just represents a special weather statement, that's what that shade of color represents. The special weather statement is about the risk of um, things getting dry and fire risk. And that's because later today, there's that wind switching directions. And we're going to have some winds that could be gusting pretty strongly in through this area that could, um, you know, easily, if, if a fire started, spread very, very quickly. Now, as I was thinking about wind a lot uh, the past several weeks, I want to talk specifically about one spot. You know that I have had concern about this upcoming growing season, about the risk of drought either being here or somewhere in the Mid-South or in the Southeast. I, I have not yet been able to place it, but I my strongest evidence as of mid-March is that if there's going to be drought east of the Rocky Mountains, it's going to be in one of these three locations as we progress through the season. We've built a case for that, and if it changes, I will let you know. But I'm, I'm always curious as we go into this critical time period for the Southern and High Plains, which is, which is April and May, which is the time of year where there are just numerous large, com, you know, very complex thunderstorm events that happen in through here that really deliver the critical rains that, that, that are needed in spring. I'm curious what, what has a kind of what, what controls that. In other words, we have a very unique setup because of the Rocky Mountains, the spine of which is somewhere in here, right? Oh, let me redraw that somewhere in through here. We then have very high elevation here that falls off into Texas. And it's all about the proximity to the Gulf of Mexico moisture. 
And we have a feature, which is called a dry line, which we draw it typically with um, this on our, like this on our weather maps, okay? And the position of that dry line, which is a boundary between very dry air on this side, that's hot, and very humid air or wet air, I'll call it on this side, uh, which is also hot, is that that boundary often serves as the trigger for getting those massive thunderstorms, the type that storm chasers love to chase. Okay, all of that is to say this. This is my question. When we have really, really dry years in this area, does that dry line change position and what could drive the change in that position? Because I pulled up here just to look since February 1st at what's, uh, what, what's called the zonal wind anomaly. Now, what's a zonal wind? When we say zonal, we're talking about winds that move from west to east. When we say meridional, we're talking about winds that move north-south. Okay, So when you look at this, the areas that are in blue had weak zonal wind, meaning there was more north-south movement. It, it could have been dipping troughs or it could have been flow coming to, it doesn't matter, north-south. What I'm curious about is given the change in elevation that happens right here, which helps to drive the position of the dry line, moves the position of the dry line. We've had very strong zonal winds in this area. And I think what that's done is that's helped to push drier air farther to the east. And over that same time period, this would be the 1st of February through the 16th of March, we've seen humidity levels in this part of Texas already well below average, okay, 10 to 15% below average in places. Now, there's other spots to be talking about, like around Iowa, which has been dry as well. But my, my, my question and concern about this, <clears throat> excuse me, is what does this mean as we progress forward? Uh, just to focus in on one area that I'm concerned about, we'll just do this in several videos for all sorts of places around the country, right? But that one area, do we maintain a stronger, stronger zonal wind with lower relative humidities going into April and May, which tend to push the dry line farther to the east? Rather than letting it set up repeatedly on a line between like Lubbock and Amarillo, is it maybe closer to Norman? And my concern is, how do we return moisture back into this area if there's a stronger zonal wind? That's the question I'm asking. Uh, and just to think about it, I went out there and I went to that West Texas Climate Division. And for April and May, I plotted since 1940 and even put a trend line on it since 1970, I plotted total precipitation. And I did this to try to find these drier April and May timeframes. And I wanted to see, do they have any specific characteristics that are important to note? And the first one was this. You could see that April to May, when we had um, very dry conditions, the humidity was already much lower to the west compared to average. I'm talking about parts of Colorado and, and New Mexico. So there was a deficit in moisture to begin with. And then what we saw was that that deficit of moisture tended to push the dry line farther and farther to the east. And so I'll be concerned about this until something overrides that concern. And one of the things that can really undo this is if you can get lows to come out of the southern plains and slowly eject and just sit here and spin to draw that moisture in and pull it all the way back to the, to the west. That, that's what needs to ha happen in this particular case. But over the last 30 days, even though we've seen that on the front range of the Rockies, we've not seen that here. And this is a large part of Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas and New Mexico that has not been able to return moisture. Now, the reason why I'm not picking on this spot to the north much right now is because you, we talked about this yesterday and last week. This is going to get hit with a lot of moisture and, and big time storms. But over the next several days, there's going to be a pretty big change in the pattern that's going to be driving systems to come out of the Rocky Mountains. And one of the more important things I want you to listen to me discuss about it is the forward speed of those low pressure systems. So we're going to do that here in a few moments. Now, first of all, good news is, is that starting on the 20th, we do have the chance of storms in this area. And that's largely being helped along by the fact that the upper level load that's been cut off over Arizona is a slow mover. It's not, it's not getting out fast. And the slower it moves, the, the better the chances are of getting the storms and the moisture back farther and farther to the west. As we get into the 21st, the stronger thunderstorm risk is going to move down here you know, in this part of southeastern Texas. So let's go ahead and have a look at what I'm referring to here by starting with the high res NAM at 7 a.m. central time this morning. So that upper level low is sitting here. 
And while that one continues to spin and produce these convective, you know, little bursts down here of some snow, some rain, we will watch also another low that sneaks here over Ontario, delivering more snow in that colder air into parts of New England after going through the Great Lakes states. So as you notice, see it sitting and spinning there? This is midday today on Wednesday. It comes out in New Mexico and it's slow. So, so what happens? By tomorrow night, the storms blow up in this area. Now, we don't have all of the right ingredients for a big, you know, typical spring severe punch here, but there's going to be storms in this area. And what's helping it is just the speed of that low. It's going to take 40 hours for it to go from here to here. That's slow. We have some times in the spring where storm systems start in Colorado and 40 hours later, they're in New York. So you see what I'm talking about, the slowness of this low. So that will be what we're going to watch right down there. Then you notice this will be what we'll watch the next day. Stronger storms possibly down here, but the system moves out. Still some snow that moves through parts of New England. And this is kind of the beginning of a very active stretch of days to the north in the northern plains, getting the upper Midwest of heavy snow right along that black line. So this is Thursday morning, playing through Thursday uh, afternoon, early afternoon. And that we're going to have to let the other models take over and see where it's going to go. But there's several intricate and complicated interactions right now with the upper level jet stream. And I think the best way to see it is to go to the, the trough ridge pattern here. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's the trough that's going to sneak out. And by the time we get into tomorrow, moves into Texas. It's not much, right? But what will be interesting to watch is on the back side of this broader trough here, there's a short wave. I'll put an L in it. And there's a short wave here. And the two of these are going to work together by the end of this week to produce a system that's going to go up the East Coast. And I want you to watch that first. So here we are on Thursday, getting into Friday and Saturday, right here, Saturday. Now, this broader trough, which is rolling through the Great Lakes, will work with the trough to the south of it. And this is some really good upper level support for producing something that goes up the East Coast. In the meantime, while that's taking shape this Saturday, this will be the broader trough that's going to sneak into the southern plains. And the speed at which it ejects out of the mountains will be critical to talking about who gets the moisture and who doesn't. So let's see where it is now. This is Saturday, getting into Sunday. That is a deep low. And it comes out here on Sunday night into Monday. And if you just kind of follow its trajectory, it's going to be doing something like that. Now, the operational models and the ensembles seem to move this system relatively quickly. I, I say that because if anything slows this down, it's going to change the next couple of maps that I'm going to show you uh, on, on where the precipitation is going to be. So we are going to watch carefully starting in the west on the 23rd and 24th. That's when the system comes in. Then if you're east of the Rocky Mountains, it's going to be something on the 25th, 26th, 27th. And then that system pulls east by the 29th. And then following that, there's another trough that comes over right around Easter, getting into Easter Monday. So we still have several more rounds uh, of, of, of storm systems coming through to finish the month of March. All right, let's go ahead and do some model comparison. Then we'll look at the actual precipitation totals. So here we are Tuesday. Let's play through Wednesday. We've already talked about this. So there's the, the chance for storms getting into Thursday. And then what I want you to see is this. Now watch as I rock back and forth. You can watch either map. I don't care. Remember how I told you there were two troughs. There's one coming around like this. It's going to interact with this snow. There's the one to the south coming out of Texas. And they both come together right here. One two. It's in both models. Now, as this spreads heavy rain and the potential for some storms in the southeast on Friday, the northern system's got more cold air in it, and they work together on Friday night into Saturday to go right across the eastern whole east coast of the United States. And that's going to be a deep low that rolls through there because these two things are going to work together. It's going to be elongated all along the coast, which means we do have the potential for very heavy rain out of this system. But the snow into the interior of New England is going to continue to be a challenge to forecast probably until the day before this event. And when is it coming through? Uh, mostly Friday night into Saturday. That's where we are here. This is Saturday morning. Now, as that system curls up and leaves the east, here we are watching the next low come out on Sunday morning, early Sunday morning into Sunday midday and working our way towards Sunday evening. Now, the speed and pace of this low will ultimately determine how far back to the west we're able to draw moisture. Now you're going, Eric, I don't even see anything in the models. No, we often don't. 
the the the, the low resolution. I, I know they're they're good resolution, but the lower resolution, longer range models typically fail to capture convection. And there's a concern that we're going to starve this for a little bit of moisture down here and therefore kind of ruin some of the instability. But I'm not set on that yet. I'm not set on getting rid of the risk of severe storms down here in the southern plains in this pattern. But here you are, midday Sunday, and the main focus we had yesterday was just on where and how much snow was going to be across the north. And just in total, what kind of moisture we're going to get. So this is Sunday midday, getting into Sunday evening, working away to early Monday morning. And we can just see that while there's a system going through the midsection of the country, we still have a low going up the east coast. And then we know that by just shortly after the system rolls through, we have another one coming into the west. I mean, this is a very, very active pattern. And we talked about yesterday, just all the lows stacked up in the Pacific are helping to aid in the flow coming over the Rockies to invigorate these systems. And now that we've kind of got an idea for the next week, let's look at some of the maps. So this is one of the maps I said I wanted to examine more closely, because if you take note over the next seven days, the systems enter the west. You can see the west precipitation. There's the very heavy snow swath right in through here. But notice how quickly the moisture drops off when you get past about the 100th meridian. It just gets much, much you know, less the farther you go. Now, considering how oh, interesting, my power just went out at home. So I'm now sitting in my basement in complete dark. Ah, oh, there it came back on. <laughs> Wonder what happened. Anyways, this this whole setup here with how far back to the west the moisture goes again is reliant on the. It's going to be reliant on the um, on the speed at which the low ejects. So, what does the European model suggest? Well, the European model has a very similar setup. There we are, to the. Um, you know, to the WPC. Gosh, but I'm, I'm curious, does this fill in as well in this pattern? Because the GFS fills it in. And so I'm just watching two areas here and here for the last spots to be kind of filled in by the storm system. We know that it's not going to hit the Canadian Prairie. There's just too much cold, dry air in this place to do that. But here and here, because the GFS is a little different solution, we have to consider. The difference in the models is this. The GFS is wetter here. That's what these colors represent. So it must be able to open up more Gulf moisture or move farther into this area quicker. And the Europeans got spots in the plains that are wetter. Very clear that the Europeans much wetter along the coast here and the east coast as well. There's a lot going on with this particular pattern. Now, to what a lot of you probably want to see, here's the snow. European model snowfall forecast. And remember, this is through midday Friday. We've already got this. Plus, we have the snow in the interior of New England. We then get into the weekend, that's Saturday, Sunday. So take a look. This is what the European is doing with that first system in New England. Okay, But then the heavy snows come in behind this. And right now, the European model out seven days is painting the snowiest stripe here from the border of North and South Dakota, right through central uh, Minnesota, right over Minneapolis in this case, and straight through one of my favorite places in the whole world, Minocqua, Wisconsin, and right over the top of uh, Lake Superior. That is where the stripe of heavy snow is going to be from the system once it gets on this side of the Rockies. The GFS has got a lot more snow in it. Uh, and spreads over a larger area, as you can see here, the heavier snow band gets even a bit farther south, even toward Madison is possible in this case. And remember, that's just through that second big system. Both models try to put another one in there later. I mean, there's, there's more snow coming in after this. So what we need to do is we need to go to the ensembles, <clears throat> excuse me, to try to get a better idea on this. So next 10 days, there's our heaviest snow stripe. That's the three inch chance. If we step it up to six inches, we end up getting uh, this map here. Oh, darn it, my internet's out. Uh, let me go upstairs and reset it, I'll be back. Okay, sorry about that, back online now. I don't know what caused the power to go out. Sometimes we have some pretty um, unlucky squirrels, I think, that get too close to transformers, I'm not sure. But anyway, back to the discussion about snow. Take a look at the probability of getting at least six inches right in through here. So we looked at three, this is six. We stepped this up to 12. There's a spot in through here that has a 50 to 70% chance of picking up a foot of snow out of this particular uh, setup in the pattern. Now from here, let's go take a look at why this is important because the latest season to date departure from normal snow map, so this goes back all the way to last uh, uh, September 30th. If we bring in a foot of snow into some of this area, which is possible, I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but it's possible, 
we could make up more than half of the deficit. I mean, if you just take a look at some of the numbers here, this is the departure uh, from average. And so this is a critical event for some very late season snowfall into this area. Now let's flip this over to the total precipitation side of things and look at who's gonna be drier. And now you can see why I started off the discussion about here. Notice that over the next 10 days, despite several systems coming across the country, the chances of staying under a tenth of an inch are still relatively high here. Not, not, they're not, you know, it's not 90%, but it's, it's there. And that's what I'm worried about going forward. That in the Canadian Prairie, there's a very sharp dividing line right here. Where you go north of this, we're not going to get much moisture out of the next several systems at all. Now on the wetter side of this, if I flip over here, yeah, we got a new model run in. Let's go back to the zero Z, get you out there to 10 days again. There we are. This is the chance over the next 10 days of getting an inch. And in that snow, there is a 90% chance that there is an inch of liquid in this. Now, snow to the north, maybe a little rain in, this, in Iowa. But as you know, this is an area that we've been discussing for months about drought recovery needs. So everything about this storm system is critical uh, for this area. Now, where we don't need all the excess rain is down here across the south, where it's been extremely wet as of late. But if we step this up to the chance of getting two inches of liquid out of it, it's coastal parts of the northwest, and it's the southeast, and possibly in through here, there's about a 30 to 50% chance that there's two inches of liquid in what's coming through. So this is kind of one of those very important early spring storm systems that if it delivers, buys a lot of time and restores some longer term soil moisture deficits. Okay, let's move beyond that and talk about week two. We still don't expect the pattern to fully slow down all the way up to the beginning of April. And that's why both in the CPC and in the GFS, we've got wetter conditions and they mimic what's going on in the European model, which is in the middle. So a lot of this is just playing out quite consistently with what we've been thinking for this pattern. On the temperature side of it, you know that we've talked about the cooler risks lasting through the first week of April. And as we look at the last week of March 1st, the 26th through the 1st, the models continue to kind of hone in on an area that's got this risk of cooler conditions returning. For example, from the 27th to the 29th, that would be next, what, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, coming in here with another shot at some cooler air. So let's go and have a look at those temperatures. We talked this morning already about the frost line getting pretty far to the south just as the sun rises. As we play this into Wednesday, that's Wednesday's morning temperatures, getting into Thursday, much colder air across the northern tier of the U.S., now here's Friday. This is when the system begins to move through the central plains. There's Saturday's low temperatures getting into Sunday. So there's plenty of cold air to be supporting all of that snow that's coming into this area. Now if we look at the high temperatures, here's today's highs. So a brief warm up in the midsection of the country. There it is on Wednesday, much colder air coming down again, getting into Thursday. Look at this contrast here. That's wind coming off the mountains versus colder air coming out of Canada. Then we get into Friday and Saturday when the low is taking shape and going into Sunday and Monday. Much colder air coming in here uh, to the western plains of the United States, the northwestern plains of the U.S. Now that's where we're expecting the big snows, right? So we're going to see that day 5 through 10, the snow uh, kind of feedback and the temperatures continue to show up cooler in the west, big ridge over Alaska. And as we get out there day 10 through 15, it still shows up. Now, you know that I've been questioning how soon can we expect to get a return of mild air. And I, I think the first week of April maintains a cooler bias, not cold, but cooler bias. And we're going to have to wait till we get maybe closer to mid-April before we just break over into good spring warmth, which is going to promote a lot of fast planting. So to kind of keep on that theme, I want to show you the last week of, uh, of March in the European extended forecast. And then let's take you out here to the first week of April, which stops there. Now watch, here's the second week of April where the model begins to relent and open up to more, <clears throat> excuse me, mild air. I'll say this, the cool here in the West, again, this is a feedback of the snowpack, which is good. I mean, it's pretty good across much of the Central Rockies, Great Basin and Sierra Nevada. There's still some deficits north, but pretty good. And then you see the rest of April, we start to bring in much more mild conditions. On the precipitation side of this, let's just take this out there 30 days and just look at the whole month of April. How about uh, to there, right? It appears to be that better chances of more moisture will show up in the forecast as we move into April. But here we go again. Can you start to pick out that spot that I've been concerned about down here in this part of Texas? How far east is that dry line? Where is, I mean, honestly, where's the best storm chasing corridor? You wanna know where the dry line is? 
follow all those storm chasers. If they're chasing a whole lot of Norman into you know central Kansas and not western Kansas, Colorado, the panhandles, then we know where that dry line is. Extremely wet, still a major concern down here in the south, but overall we expect some decent spring rains which are needed. I do believe we will find windows in here, early opportunities to plant a crop in the Midwest though. Okay, let's flip over next though to another model just to show you that the CFS V2 is still kind of lingering some of that cooler air into the first week of April and a little bit into the second week of April, but to be a degree or two cooler than average isn't overly concerning for me. What I'm watching is for the MJO to move. So we know that as it comes out into phase 781, it's not way out here, but it's it's here, okay? That before it collapses, we're gonna get probably two to three weeks of the influence of seven, eight, and one. And what that means is the last two weeks of March into the first week of April, we just tend to have troughs of low pressure and colder air. That's what MJO phase one does in March. This is what it does in April. But if we, we pop this MJO back out over here toward Australia, like phase four or five, you just tend to get more mild air in. So that's what we're waiting on. I still think there's a strong tropical connection to the MJO, which is sliding over the now neutral El Nino situation. Okay, last couple things to think about here. My forecast doesn't really agree well with what the CPC released on Friday. Not so much on the precipitation side, but on the temperature. So I want you to know there are some conflicting forecasts out there. I kind of made the case of a cooler start to April, and they've made a case, especially here, for a more mild start to April compared to average. And we just need to watch to see how quickly the pattern evolves to return warmth. I, 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 I don't know. I think it's going to be later rather than sooner. And let me just make sure that's clear. When we get into April, remember, April is a transition time. We tend to get more mild anyway. It's just a question as to are we much above average in temperatures or are we closer to average? I think we're going to have the discussion about. All right, from there, I'm working on some new long-range stuff for you. I'll give it to you at the end of the week. But I wanted to bring up the influence of this whole discussion that we just had on South America. So what you've got is right now, best rising motion for the next seven to 10 days here. And that sits right on top of South America. But the question becomes, when do we start to pull back in some sinking motion into this area? Is it once we get to April and beyond? Possibly, because I think the MJO does do a reset back over here to phase one for a little while. All right, so if that, if that occurs, what does it end up doing to South America? Well, in the near term, it's very supportive of this. And that is some pretty heavy rains on some key states. Mato Grosso, part of Mato Grosso do Sol, Goiás. This is uh, Sao Paulo and over here toward uh, Minas Gerais. These, these areas need the moisture. It's wet into southern Brazil. A little bit drier forecast now for Argentina, but not a major concern. I want to know how long that lasts. Because if the MJO pops back out into phase four or five, this is gone for April. Okay, so we are going to pay close attention to that. But new long-range model runs are not as favorable on the dry side for those that are wanting some drier conditions in this area. So just need to bring that up to your attention. What I want to finish with here is a bit of a global outlook. So let's do this. This is the newest update, 10 days global precipitation from the ECMWF. A couple of interesting things to take note of, quite wet from India all the way through parts of China. We're quite wet throughout much of Europe, save Italy, even wet over toward the Black Sea countries. Very, very wet in Northern Australia. All right, so they're slipping into fall here. Extremely wet across the north, and we've seen multiple rounds of heavy rain in pockets of Australia that need to be discussed as well. And if we look at global temperatures, now the only spots that are cooler than average, this part of Siberia, big section here of North Central North America, and that little spot there in Australia, not little, it's a huge spot in this part of Australia that is maintaining some, uh, some cooler weather. Most of Europe and a lot of Asia, very mild uh, start to this spring. So we're going to drop it off there. We'll talk again to, uh, tomorrow morning. I'll be in Texas for that one. So we'll see you then. Thanks.